Hi everybody, it's Dr. Robert Pierce. I'm an Australian family physician. I'm based in Melbourne in Australia and I'm a family physician which uh, is the American expression in, in this country we call it general practitioner and of course we see a bit of everything and I've been in practice for 40 years or so. Uh, my subject today is bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. These are called the psychoses. These are serious mental disorders. Schizophrenia affects perhaps less than about 1% of the population roughly. It varies around the world by the way and there's a better outcome in poorer countries. And bipolar disorder in its severe form affects about 1% of the population and in its less severe form another 1% and some degree of something like it, cyclothymic disorder or exuberant personality affects another 2.5%. So it looks like the bipolar genes are found in about 4.5% possibly of all people around the world. That's remarkable. They're not all sick. Only about half of them have got a significant problem. I'll come on to why that is. So if we, if we look at this... Uh, uh, look at bipolar first, and the same thing applies to schizophrenia. I've been able to dissect these disorders into three separate parts. Sometimes there are only two parts in one person. We have genes for bipolar disorder, which don't cause bipolar disorder. They cause benign unipolar hypomania, that is a mildly elevated mood state seen in, for example, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, or in the composer George Handel, who wrote uh, the... the uh, the, the, uh, his oratorios often in a, few, in a few weeks, like the Messiah. Uh, these were hypomanic individuals. They never became manic and out of control and needed to be taken away, and they never became depressed. They were consistently mildly hypomanic, just elevated mood to a very useful degree, as you see in many success, successful entrepreneurs and musicians and comedians too. So they're not all mad. So the genes appear to cause only benign unipolar hypomania, nothing bipolar, no depression and no severe mania. There's no evidence that they cause any more than that. So how do we get from these benign genes, or in the case of schizophrenia, schizotypy genes, that's a mild thing too, just a loner with strange ideas, but he's not crazy. How do we get from there to the full-on, full-blown psychosis, that is manic depressive illness, you know, bipolar disorder, or full-on schizophrenia? We have to add two more things, in my view, because the three parts of these diseases are the genes, which have to be present, don't necessarily drive it completely, you need something else. You need a fatty diet very frequently. This oxidizes and inflames the brain. This is a very common a diet very commonly eaten by bipolars who are frequently pre-diabetic and overweight, very frequently. And also in schizophrenia, it's a poor sort of a diet, especially in poorer suburbs. A lot of butter and cheese and that ubiquitous chocolate that people get into. We've got a very fatty diet here, which will oxidise and inflame the brain and destroy some of the connections. Then we've got anxiety disorder. This is the third component. This comes from a fatty maternal diet. This is not the person's diet. This is the mother's diet in pregnancy, usually dairy fats like butter and cream and ice cream and chocolate in cakes and pastries made with butter maybe. So we have a fatty maternal diet causing anxiety disorder which affects about one in four Westerners and which was unknown in primitive societies by the way and when you have anxiety disorder you tend to eat the chocolate anyway because you're anxious so you, you'll get all three. So you may have bipolar genes which are good genes and you should be a successful business person, entrepreneur or musician or comedian or an artist maybe, very good at drawing and with quite considerable talent. You, that's what you should be doing. But because you're anxious, your mother ate a fatty diet, because you're anxious and you maybe eat the, a bit of fatty food yourself, you've got a terrible mixture in your brain of stress hormones, uh, driving mania for example, and you've got a fatty diet was causing degeneration and loss of your excellent wits. You'll, co you'll, you'll get cognitive decline and if you go on uh, with normal psychiatric treatment, with the usual drugs used, you'll get a, a, a control of this for some time, but ultimately you'll get diabetes because these drugs make you eat more. So it's toxic and we can't guarantee that our bipolar patients on standard psycho psychiatric medications will live longer than 55. They're, they're probably all dead before they're 60. So we actually kill them and this is something we should be ashamed of because psychiatry does not do any nutrition. We have similar principles apply to schizophrenia where if you could institute a low fat diet and if you could treat the anxiety with inositol supplement which, you, which uh, we could also do obviously in bipolar then we should get a very good result and I've actually achieved this in about half a dozen bipolar patients in my practice and an equal number of people with schizophrenia who are much more stable, much healthier, got good cognition and good insight and don't need any psychiatric drugs at all. So the theory is that if you can reverse most of the brain damage caused by fatty diet 
and by stress, the, the anxiety disorder. We must use a Nositol supplement, five grams a day for the anxiety disorder. We must have a very low fat diet, a good dietitian, And we also need a good psychologist here. We don't necessarily need a psychiatrist, probably counterproductive. We should see the original, what we call the original phenotype. That is what the genes actually do and hopefully not too much worse than that. A, a hypermanic person who's still a bit on the go, but he's rational and sensible, they've got a lot of energy, we actually want these people, they're very successful in society, if we can get that, that's good, and in schizophrenia, the most we can hope for uh, is a schizotypy individual, a bit of a loner, some strange ideas, definitely rather odd, but not psychotic and not needing an ambulance and not needing a psychiatrist. They can get a job, they can maybe settle down, they can maybe get married. So that's what we can achieve in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, is to look at these as having three parts each, or sometimes just two, like the genes plus the fatty diet or the genes plus the anxiety. Quite often it's all three mixed together. These are, these are uh, two-thirds two of the disease can be treated. Uh, with the low-fat diet and the inositol. So if we can remove two-thirds of what's going on, as I say, we're left with just the genes. And the evidence is, as we see in unaffected twins, when there's an identical twin not affected, there's something there. There's a bit of a hypomanic individual, but not bipolar. And there's a bit of a loner, a bit of a, an odd fellow. And he's OK, he can probably work. The main thing is to get him to work, and, and you can succeed in doing that. And uh, so that's a new way of looking at this disease, that it's a nutrigenetic disease, there's a genetic component, but we don't want to change the genes or block the genes in bipolar. It wouldn't hurt to change or block the genes in schizotypy because they are a little bit slightly off, slightly bad, uh, but that's a long way ahead in the future. In the meantime, outstanding issues in the schizophrenia community are to get onto a low-fat diet, which has been done here in Melbourne actually with some success, and to treat, must treat any anxiety, history of shyness uh, and, and excessive worrying, which, which drives the smoking and the chocolate eating, must treat that with five grams a day of inositol, which costs 50 cents. So we've got a whole new way of treating these two uh, fairly common psychoses, and I think it's going to be successful.